on a few for this uh, global health conversation series. We've had a few now with uh, universities in, in uh, other parts of the world, including with Colombia and uh, yeah, Belize. And Jesse will tell us, you know, I, and uh, Thailand. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons we pushed yours back to April was because of the time difference. It, we just couldn't find a good time because it would be either late, too late for us or too early in the morning. So we waited for the clock to change. And uh, that's how we said that we'll, we'll set this up for April. So welcome each and uh, welcome all of you. My name is Lynette Menezes. I am, um, I'm sorry. Uh, I am the Assistant Vice President for International for USF Health and the Assistant Dean for International for USF Health. And I'm also an associate professor of medicine in the division of infectious disease and international medicine. Um, USF has a robust program and the College of Medicine as well. Um, you know, I have we have been collaborating with uh, Dr. Yamamoto for for several years now, and we've had students that have gone to Gifu uh, through study abroad as well as medical students. Our public health students have had fabulous experiences and. Uh, medical student as well. And we were going to send more students, but unfortunately the pandemic hit. And so for the last two years, we have unfortunately been unable to send anybody and we hope to start this all, you know, start back up sending our students. We've also been very lucky to welcome some of your students for the past few years. And uh, again, last year and this year, we've not been able to, um, host any of the Gifu students and we hope that we will be able to do in 2022. So with that, I wanted to welcome each and every one of you again for this Global Health Conversation series. I have my delightful students from our international medicine concentration here. I also have uh, Jesse. Jesse has been the one coordinating the whole thing. Jesse Casanova, who's our assistant director for international. And I, I don't think Tina and Jamie are here, are they? Jesse? Yes, Tina's here. Okay. Oh, that's Tina, who's also been uh, a big help in coordinating this event. I think Jamie couldn't make it. Um, and then we'll, I think we'll go around and have a round of introductions. If, if Dr. Yamamoto wants to start from your side, and then our students can introduce themselves. All right. Uh, I'm yeah, uh, Mayumi Yamamoto, uh, Director of Health Administration Center of Diff University. I spent three years in the United, uh, USF as a postdoc, and also uh, I met my husband there uh, more than 20 years ago. <laughs> so anyway, um, so uh, thank you very much for uh, to, uh, Joshi and uh, Lynn and uh, the staff of the USF to have the opportunity uh, to make a conversation uh, between the USF and the Gifu University Medical School. And actually uh, we have uh, lots of experiences to uh, invite uh, USF students and also uh, uh, we send uh, excellent uh, medical school students to, to, to uh, visiting the USF and they spend uh, uh, so happy uh, experiences and uh, good memories. And uh, uh, today, uh, the supported by the Medical Education Development Center of Gifu University School of Medicine, uh, especially the uh, effort uh, support by the Dr. Imafuku and the Dr. Saiki, uh, we could select the excellent students from <laughs> Gifu University. So I hope the one hour, almost one hour, hour should be the good good time for both of us. Thank you. So, do, Dr. Imafuku, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, uh, I'm Rintaro Imafuku from uh, Medical Education Development Center, Gifu University. And I'm re really happy to see you in the during the, this uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And also the thanks to the Lin and also Professor Yamamoto, um, my medical medical student uh, have experienced and joined the 
uh, clinical electives at uh, General Hospital in the Tampa. Yes. I, guess, uh, I think around uh, four students already yes. joined before. And also, um, I, I hope uh, next year, maybe some students join the Tampa General Hospital practice. And also, uh, it's a good opportunity for the, our student as well as the USF student to see and have a chat conversation uh, here. So thank you, uh, Jesse, <laughs> good opportunity. And yeah, and I'm also look forward to uh, see you in person in the Tampa or in Gifu in the yes. near future. <laughs> thank yes. you very yes, much. Yes, it's yeah. time. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Saiki, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, hello, nice to meet you. I'm Takuya Saiki, a faculty of Medical Education Development Center. And thank you for inviting and thank you for coordinating uh, such a kind of uh, conference. And uh, I'm very excited to join this uh, meeting, your web meeting, which will be a new standard in future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, does Yuko, do you want to go and introduce yourself? We'll have all the Gifu students first and then the USF students. Nice to meet you. My name is Yuko Kawakami. I'm a medical student of Gifu University. I want to study English more and more, so I decided to join this, uh, this meeting. Uh, Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kevin? Uh, hello, my name is Kevin Zahara, and I'm the uh, fifth year student in Gibby University. And I'm very interested in the medical environment in America. So I'm very happy to join this meeting today. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Nobuyasu? Nice to I'm a sixth grade student. Actually, I plan to go to your school before the pandemic, but because of the pandemic, the program was canceled. So today I'm happy to see you. Thank you very much. Thank you and welcome. So um, Matt, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Matthew. I'm in MS1 here at USF. Uh, and I'm really excited to take part in this conversation, get to know everyone and just collaborate with GIFU uh, in the future. Thank you. And Matt is one of the students who's also working on a project with uh, Dr. Yamamoto um, and her team. I think Rintaro, is, he, is Rintaro also working with you on that same project, Dr. Yamamoto? Is yes. Dr. Ima? Yeah, yeah. So his. So and unfortunately, Ma, uh, Matt was supposed to go to Japan, but we had to. We couldn't send him. Hopefully, one day in the future. Yes. It's an amazing. For sure. Sure. Donia, I'm looking forward to that. Hi everyone. My name is Donia. I'm also a medical student here at USF. I'm super excited we're doing this tonight, and I'm really um, excited to hear about the perspective in Japan. Thank you, Donia. Beatriz. Hello, my name is Beatriz. I'm also a first year uh, medical student here at USF. And I've always been very excited in international medicine and I'm very excited to talk to you guys today. Thank you, Beatriz. Sharon. Hi guys, um, my name is Sharon. I'm a first year medical student uh, like the rest of my colleagues here. And I'm excited to talk to you guys. It's gonna be a fun conversation. and. I think we're just really excited that uh, we could make this work. So thank you. So wonderful. So what I'm going to do is start with, so I had a small, a brief presentation, but I am concerned that I might be answering some of the questions in advance. So I've decided I'm only going to talk about a couple of slides and then, uh, you know, we can get the conversation started and I can always add in some of the sl those slides if there is an interest. Oh, so I have to, Jesse, that doesn't show my, my, well, it looks like I'll have to move it into a box. 
doesn't allow me to find the slide on my computer. It, it should if it's pulled up. Like if it's open, no, it's showing me a screen. I don't want to do that. Yes, Is it allowing you to share? Oh, wow. It's going into a hole. Here, let me make you a, a host. We're so used to using uh, Teams for everything. So I'm not, I, I don't really use Zoom. Okay. Let me see if it does that. Does, can you all see it? Yes. Okay, perfect. So, So I quickly wanted to talk a little bit about telehealth in the US and about um, what we have done at USF Health. So some of the benefits you all know about telehealth and being able to communicate with maybe your healthcare provider or uh, you know uh, another person that might help you with your health related issues. In it could be you know it could be a community health worker in another you know in countries that are impoverished or poor. It could be different kinds of providers that you would be able to use in an electronic format. So you could, there are many ways to do it and you all are aware about that. So I'm not going to go into that discussion. But in general, some of the benefits of telehealth are, you can, be, you can talk to your doctor from the comfort of your home. You don't have to go anywhere. It helps you to not have to travel. And for a lot of people, it makes a huge difference because you might not have to take time off from work. It can, it can take you based on traffic, it could take you an hour to get to see your doctor, you know, an hour to go and come back, depending on what city you live in. You could have terrible weather and that could increase the commute even further. Uh, you might have to take leave from work and for many women, they have to find child childcare. So it's uh, helpful if they are, if for all of those reasons. The other thing is, if you see in many countries, uh, there are no specialists. And let me tell you about the United States. If you go to a, a state like Texas, we have very few doctors in some of the rural locations. And for miles and miles, you will not have a doctor. And if you think in terms of a specialist, it would be even further away. So one of the greatest advantages, I think, is to be able to get like a specialist and a subspecialist, as in some places, they might call them super specialists. So you might want to have someone who is a pediatric gastroenterologist, which is really a super specialty or a subspecialty as we call it in the US. And those are not going to be easy to find. Forget about even, you might not even have a gastroenterologist, but forget about looking at somebody who is as narrow as pediatric or as narrow as an intervention, interventional gastroenterologist. So those are some things that could benefit somebody who is in a setting like this. The, uh, one of the other things, it can be a good global teaching tool in impoverished countries. So you go into a poor country, from here we can teach people in another country how to be able to see certain kinds of patients or if there are certain health issues that people don't know how to treat. There's a way that you can connect. There's a way that you can, you know, people do that even for surgeries today. So you, you use a, a, a telehealth setup to be able to teach people how to do surgeries in other countries, particularly special specialty surgeries. So it's a great global teaching uh, tool. Uh, and as you know, in the pandemic, it has been one of the best inventions um, for the COVID-19 pandemic because you can maintain social distancing, right? Because you are in two different locations and people are no longer close to each other. One thing that happened in the US was uh, because of 
because COVID-19 was declared as a public health emergency, the rules were changed. As you know that the United States is very, very strict about HIPAA, you know, we have like the HIPAA Act where uh, privacy of a patient is critical. And so you have to be really careful when any kind of, uh, you know, things like identifying information of patients. So when you see somebody in a telehealth setup, it's very identifying, right? But they did change their federal policy because of COVID-19. And doctors are now allowed to use video chat applications beyond just the ones that we would have through Doximity or, or the medical health video chat applications that are there for each um, hospital. Because people have their own that they have developed with another vendor outside. Other than those, they even allow FaceTime, Facebook Messenger video chat, as well as Google Hangouts video chat, Zoom and Skype. All of these have been uh, approved by the federal government now. And then the, quickly, I'm going to tell you about telehealth at USF Health, and then I'm going to stop there. So when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, our first case in Tampa was March 1st. And uh, our first case came where somebody from Tampa traveled to Italy, and that's how it came, you know, that's how we detected. But of course, by then there was community transmission. We were just not aware about it. That was the first case that was tested. So at that time in March, we, uh, Dr. Oxner, who is one of our uh, leaders for our scholarly concentration as well, and she's the vice chair of medicine, she got really involved and started with uh, started a COVID confirmed clinic. And in the initial stages when we were developing this clinic, what we did was a very, it was a really neat model. We got medical students, PA students and nursing students involved, and they were calling patients to complete like a baseline survey to ask them all this, all their medical history. As soon as we found a, a patient was positive, the patient was referred to this clinic. And this COVID confirmed clinic, we started calling it COCO Clinic. Uh, we used to get patients from the health department that would be anybody in the Tampa area, as well as our own patients who were referred from our USF Health Mursani Clinic and our Tampa General Hospital Clinic. So those were the patients that would come to our, uh, come to this, not come, but they, those were the patients that we talked with via telehealth. So, the, so our students would first talk to the patients, then they would staff uh, with the medical resident and finally with the attending physician. So it was a neat way for us to have our students engaged in a whole telehealth uh, clinic. Unfortunately, I think the first years didn't have that opportunity, but our second, third and fourth years had the opportunity to volunteer. We particularly took the fourth year students and then the third year students were the ones that volunteered the most. And I think the second years got a little bit of chance to do that as well. Um, we just until November 2020, when the students were involved, after November 15, students stopped and, and the whole program was transferred to a healthcare provider network through Tampa General Hospital. But over 6,500 telehealth visits were done between April and November 15, 2020, and all staffed by students, medical residents, and our attending. And at USF Health, across specialties, we've had over 160,000 telehealth visits since March 2020. So, and this was until uh, last week. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of stats that happened on our side. With that, I'm going to let you guys open the conversation and you know, I can show you some other slides later if we need those. You guys, is my screen unshared now or it's still? No, you're still sharing. Uh, can you stop it for me, Jesse? I don't know what is going on. Okay, let's see. I'm trying to find the. It's at the very bottom. Um, when you yeah, but it's not showing up. I can see all of you, but it's. When you toggle your mouse to the screen at the very bottom, it'll it'll pop up. Oh, here yeah. I see. It's there. We go. Yes. It went to the top. Okay. All right, and I think um, our students have prepared a list of questions, um, and I shared those with uh, Dr. Mafuku um, also in advance. 
Um, so Sharon or, or Matt, do you guys want to get started? Um, what, was, what was one of the questions that you had? Uh, I can get started. Um, the United States and even Tampa as a whole and everywhere here is, is quite geographically expansive compared to Japan and uh, the size of cities and the overall country size. So how has telehealth improved or how has it been used there? And have you seen a big difference in the way you reach like more rural populations or is it um, not, not too different? To Kevin and uh, any of you want want to tell us a little bit more about how telehealth is used in Japan? Uh, before the Corona, uh, yeah. sure. yes, uh, telehealth was uh, used only for people that can't uh, go to the hospital because. Uh, for example, they can't walk outside or they can't move from their beds. But uh, for because of the corona, uh, people that uh, were had the coronavirus uh, can use the telehealth. So I think it was used to more people after the corona. Okay. Do any of y'all here in the, one of our students want to share what happened with telehealth in the US? Sure, I can, I can talk a little bit about that. Sure. Um, so uh, pre the COVID pandemic, telehealth um, wasn't uh, used very often uh, in medicine. Um, it was beginning to become a little bit more expansive but uh, the COVID pandemic has really uh, expedited that process uh, and allowed physicians to uh, see a lot more patients um, through telehealth as Dr. Menezes showed earlier. Um, I think there was 160,000 telehealth visits over the past even couple of months. So it's really uh, opened up opportunities to see patients that uh, might typically not have very good access. Um, I think it's been especially beneficial for helping to reach patients in more rural uh, environments and people who wouldn't have access to come physically to the hospital to see a physician. Um, and, and I think it's probably gonna be something that increases in use uh, even post pandemic after widespread use of the vaccine. Of the vaccine. Um, I, I foresee telehealth being something that's important to all physicians practices and something that we're gonna have to become more comfortable with in, in helping our patients. I think that might be a good segue for next questions. Beatrice and Tonya and all. So I can go ahead and ask another one following up to that. So do you think that now that telehealth is being used more in Japan and around the world, do you think that it's going to help increase the number of patients that can be seen in Japan, not just COVID patients, but for every situation? Do you want them to talk slowly, Yoko and Nobuyasu? Yeah, I'm sorry. I speak very fast by nature, so I can definitely slow down. So you have to ask slowly. Yeah, because for them, English is not their first language. I'll, I'll ask again. I'm sorry. It's my bad. So uh, I know that in the States, telehealth is being used more and more for everything. So not just for things involving the COVID pandemic. But in Japan, I know you said that, that telehealth is being used a lot for COVID patients, but is it also going to be used normally to see all, to see all kinds of patients? And do you think that that would affect uh, patient care? And would the quality go up uh, now having that extra resource? Yes, in Japan, mm. We have to need a prescription if they want to some drug, some medicine. 
but before the pan but because of the pandemic a lot of patient don't want to go to the hospital so for them they can use a telescope so yeah so i think the telehealth ter 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 is beneficial for all patient not only not only the corona virus patient i think um, thank you. yeah thank you so much uh, what i was wondering is if you guys have noticed that specific uh, populations in japan that typically don't have a lot of money or access to doctors do you feel like they in specific have had more access to doctors now that telehealth has become a thing? Or do you feel like they are still um, not receiving the same level of care or access to care? I had the news that some Japanese want to talk to a doctor uh, face to face. So, because, uh, so that's why I think the terrorists will not uh, increase the number of people who want to use the, uh, who talk to a doctor with terrorists, I think. So, so in other words, you are saying that in Japan, people are... Uh... It's kind of like a cultural thing, right? You want to see your doctor face to face. You don't want them on a screen. So is that the reason you think that people will, you will not increase the number of telehealth appointments in the US? Yeah, I, I think so. Good point. Uh, I, have, I, have, I have a question for everyone. Um, what do you do you feel that the quality of healthcare through telehealth is the same, higher or lower than if you were to see a doctor in person? So I can, I, go ahead, Matt. Sorry. Um, so just in terms of the quality, I think it's oftentimes harder to diagnose something that may be more serious where you might need to uh, listen to something or run tests or take uh, x-rays or CT scans. Um, I think that's something that's not conducive um, to telehealth, but I feel like people are a lot more open when they're in the, in the comfort of their own home. So I feel like it's definitely a benefit for patients to, to have that comfort. And it might, at least in the United States, be a way to facilitate uh, the patient uh, physician interaction and help to uh, create more honest and like open relationships. And that could be a very good thing um, for physicians, at least in the United States. Yeah. Oh, I think Beatrice is next actually. You're good. Don't worry. So uh, to add, to add to Matt's point, I think that uh, doctors use a lot of like body language and visual cues and things like that to help diagnose their patients or to help their patients. And through screens, it's very difficult, right? Because all we see, I mean, all I see is everybody's face. So I can't, I don't really know, you know, how you're moving, how you're feeling. I think it's harder to present on screen than it is in person. So I think maybe the quality would suffer a little bit because of that. Great. Donia? Yeah gonna say is that um, I think it does suffer especially for certain things like what Matt was saying how it's kind of harder to diagnose patients I think there are some things where the person may already have an idea of what's wrong and they kind of need the doctor to tell them what medicine they need to take and for those cases I think telehealth is really convenient and amazing but I think when the patient has no idea what's wrong it's a lot harder because it's so hard to diagnose without any tests, without even being able to see the person face to face. Um, and I was actually going to ask before this, if people thought, or if anyone in this group thinks that 
the cost of a visit to the doctor should be the same for telehealth versus in person. Because I know some people like value being face to face more. So I wonder if that's going to turn into higher costs for being in person versus over telehealth. What do y'all think? Should telehealth be less expensive than a telehealth visit should cost less than a regular visit? So I, I believe if I'm not mistaken that um, in Japan, you're, you don't have to pay to visit a physician and to have a doctor's office. I could be wrong, but in the United States, I think it would be, be beneficial if it was uh, less expensive for patients to be able to see a doctor nonetheless uh, through through telehealth. So maybe, so so Matt, that might be a good segue for them to tell us a little bit more about their healthcare system and how how do your patients, like what is the, what is the format if I'm sick to go and see a doctor? Like, do you go to a clinic or like, for example, in China, you have to, Go to what, go into a hospital, even if you have a fever. You don't. We don't have that system in the U.S. Everybody has to first go and see their primary care provider in a clinic. You don't go into a hospital. So, can you tell us a little bit more about your healthcare system in Japan? We need to go to a clinic uh, in the first, and if the clinic can't. Uh, cure our injuries or infection, um, we need to go to a bigger hospital. And okay. the, yeah, and it will be the same. I think it, it is the same in the United States. So, so for example, um, we don't, so the next level is I go to a primary care provider, right? So maybe I have um, something going on with my heart. Right, but my primary care doctor does not feel comfortable to treat me. They will still send me to another clinic, but with a specialty doctor, like they'll send me to a cardiology clinic. They won't send me to a hospital. So do you have specialty clinics also, not just primary care? Like cardiology clinic, pulmonary clinic for lungs, for um, you know your stomach gast gastroenterology clinics, do you have those? Yes, we have those uh, specialty clinics, but okay. Uh, yes, but I think most of the cases we you go to a hospital. Okay. Can I little mention about the uh, national healthcare system in Japan for the U.S. students? Probably the much you understand uh, uh, he attended in my previous class, but basically we have the a complete universe type of the national health care system in Japan, much different from United States. Uh, you should have uh, the mainly the private sector, but uh, in Japan, the old prices for medical services, including telemedicine is uh, decided by the national committee every year, the same med, uh, medical care, me, uh, medical services, same medicine, the same treatment, same operation, or same price all over Japan, even between the public hospital or private hospital, big hospital or small hospital, professor or resident, the price is the same. And the almost average prices in Japan medical services are almost one tenth compared to the United States standard. Very inexpensive and also the maximum payment level per month is decided. Commonly, even if you are the very rich person, you have to pay uh, uh, until uh, less than uh, 10,000 yen per month. So even if you have this big serious disease, you don't need to pay uh, less than, you, you have to pay less than 10,000 yen. So very easy, we are very free to uh, access to the home doctor always. And so the, uh, in these two decades, 
almost 20 years, we have developed the telemedicine mainly in the home uh, doctor's relationship with the elder person. You know that we are faced to a super elder society. Yes. More than 25% of population are now over 65 years old. So uh, we have a bunch of the uh, uh, old people living alone in the rural area. So uh, we have developed the home doctor uh, services for the uh, mainly the old people. Uh, the, what is the telemedicine strong point? Very easy access, very frequent, and uh, very easy. And uh, just, uh, uh, for example, the older in home doctor, and the mainly the uh, not only the uh, special care, but also uh, uh, some health checking, or sometimes the um, how can I say uh, uh, using the nursing care uh, long term insurance we have, so which provide the nursing care uh, uh, based on the uh, another not uh, uh, medical health care system, but also the social health care system. So the home doctor have to conduct the, the uh, how to support the life of the old people. This is really uh, important uh, uh, function of the home doctor. So I can say the telemedicine in Japan is slowly uh, developing in mainly the home doctor services area. And uh, also the, another thing, we have to uh, take care about the difference of the pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic situation. Do you have to know the, how much difference the number of the patients between the United States and the Japan? Still, uh, the number of the this number accumulated, this number in Japan is still, uh, this is the newspaper. Uh, today's data is our accumulated, this number is 9,724 people uh, accumulated. So, which means more than one year, our this number uh, related COVID-19, this number is still less than 10,000. How, this is in how Gifu, many right? people died in, in, in the United States? Much different. The suffering, the effect uh, of the uh, COVID-19 uh, fear or some uh, emergency <laughs> situation is much, much different from the United States and the Japan. We have patients, Gifu University uh, Hospital has COVID-19 patients. Of course we have, but the, Fortunately, uh, the much, much less number in Japan. That's why the some force, the, 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 the uh, power of the effect of COVID-19 pandemic to the telemedicine is a little bit different. But however, we have, we have uh, the uh, teleprescription services for common disease, chronic disease patient. I'm a diabet uh, diabetologist, so uh, uh, very stable patients. We, uh, there's some patients require the telemedicine and the teleprescription services. We do, and which is covered by the national health insurance. But national health insurance uh, recommend the patients to visit the doctors to check the your condition more preciously, more frequently. This is the, our health policy. So uh, uh, the third point is you have to know the telemed uh, medical policy, including telemedicine service, should change or how to keep the quality of the medical services. So three points you should know: the difference of the uh, medical service system, national healthcare system, and the, the second is the difference of the COVID-19 situation. The third point is health policy uh, for the telemedicine service. 
So uh, this is my comment. So thank you for taking your time. Thank you so much, Mayumi. That was wonderful. Other questions? I have a follow-up question. I think we have Ivana. Ivana, you want to introduce yourself? Ivana has joined us late. She's one of our medical students. Ivana, you're muted if you're going to speak. Okay, she's probably not here. Jamie, do you want to say hi? Yeah, sure. Give me one second. And introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. Sorry, I had class, so I had to join a little bit late. Okay, sorry, it's real sunny in my room. Okay, my name is Jamie. I am the program coordinator or program assistant for USF Medicine International. Um, and I help coordinate for the International Medicine Scholarly Concentration, which are um, these awesome USF students here today. So um, thank you. I'm so glad to be here. And I apologize for being late and I apologize for my sunny room. <laughs> Thanks, Jamie. Hi, I'm Ivana. I'm sorry I was late too. I was getting some food between class. Um, I'm a first year as well. Um, I joined the international SCP uh, because travel and international um, knowledge has always been a big part of my life and I've been really excited to learn more. Thank you, Ivana. So do, do you all want to, uh, you have other questions, I think, Sharon? I think Beatrice wanted to ask a follow-up oh, question. Sorry, Beatrice, to... go ahead. Yes. I, I was curious, um, do you think the size of the elderly population in Japan would then have an impact on, uh, on the spread of telehealth? And then you said that there are, there are home visits for them. So then would telehealth be slowed down and not used as frequently because of that? Sorry, Beatrice, can you repeat that once more? Just go a little slower. I'm sorry. Okay, so I was, I was wondering, because of the, of the size of the elderly population in Japan, uh, do you think that telehealth would be slowed down or not used as much? Because uh, you also mentioned that you have home visits for these people. So then would telehealth be used less as a result? Thank you for talking yeah. through. Thank you. Um, um, in Japan, uh, the population of uh, elderly people is higher than U.S. in, in Japan. Japan, <laughs> higher than U.S. So, in Japan, should should sorry in Japan, telehealth is should be more accepted, but. Elderly people <laughs> don't like devices or mm, telehealth. So now in Japan, telehealth is not yet widely accepted. And in the future, I don't think Mm, telehealth is more accepted, I don't think. <laughs> Sorry. So that is a great point I think you made, Yuko, because uh, we forget that elderly don't like smartphones and many of them might not be comfortable with smartphones. So particularly if they are in their 80s and 90s, 
um, I mean, smartphones started, you know, the last 10 years, I think, or I don't even know whether smartphones were there. Yeah, well, yes. Uh, and before that, we had flip phones and, you know, other phones. So people are not used to using uh, smartphone devices. So I think it's a bit challenging for elderly and particularly if they are in rural locations, um, you know, they're not going to be exposed so much to smartphone devices. So um, we have the same issue here in the US as well. And I can uh, show you a graph for that um, quickly. So, you know, you can see the difference. Uh, excuse me, the, the Kevin or one of us, do you have any information about the robot service, robots, nurses? In yes, the because they, they mentioned that in the BB, there was a great um, docu not, uh, uh, snippet in the BBC about the robot service for the elderly in Japan. I was going to ask you that. So I'm glad you brought it up. Kevin, you want to talk about that? Uh, I'm not very sure about robot service, but uh, so I know that uh, it is used for people that can't move uh, or can't walk. So and so the nurse doesn't have to go to the house of the patient, and uh, the robot will uh do the move of the patient like if the patient will be on the same place uh they will get uh a bruise i think um uh, by pushing the same place of their body and the robot will uh replace the patient so and then will make uh the patient more comfortable in their house and nobody would need to go to the patient's house and uh, care care about them uh, uh, anytime the patient has the infection or has the injuries, I think. So I'm not very sure about the robot health. So the robot will provide some health care also? Mayumi, because um, what I had seen was they were offering social support where um, they were able to talk to the, because, you know, the elderly were lonely and had nobody yes. to talk oh, with. Okay. So they were kind of like, their, they became their friends um, by yeah. literally by talking to them and being, you know, like, a, like one of their friends in their home. It was a very interesting uh, concept and they had names for them and, oh, um, yeah. So that is one thing I saw, but but this is great if there is some healthcare provided at the same time. Okay. So the robots has three strong points. One is the robots cannot infect COVID-19. So they provided the cleaning service at the floor of the COVID-19 patients. The second is uh, they have the big power, as Kevin said. So uh, the, for rehabilitation or support for the moving, uh, prevent of the uh, so the safetyness, uh, prevent of the some uh, slip down or something. So uh, the, the 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 for the mainly the uh, old patients. If we can use for the some supporters as <laughs> some supporters for the rehabilitation, okay. and the three point, third point is uh, uh, their uh, their intelligence is dramatically developing, so they <clears throat> can express some kind of the uh, mental release phrase. So uh, the some patients yeah. or sometimes. Uh, exchange the uh, conversation, uh, which means the, uh, the good medicine for the uh, mental condition or mental illness, better than medicine sometimes. So, yeah, good social support for sure. Other questions? 
So I'm, I'm wondering if um, the students from Gifu have any questions for our students. Yes. Yuko, Nobuyasu, and Kevin, what questions you have for the USF students? So watching the news in Japan, uh, so, well, the uh, the coronavirus was a great impact in U.S. and like uh, Mr. Yamamoto said, uh, the uh, people infected by the corona is very different in Japan and America. And also, uh, uh, there was a big change in uh, in the po politics in America. And uh, so you had two big problems in these, uh, in this few months, I think, uh, in this year. So I want to ask, uh, well, how big did America change in this year? Come on. I'm well, sure you all have lots to say about that. It changed a lot. We, um, I think life in America is very different now. I honestly, I can't even really point to specifics, but life is different. People, there's no like organized crowds. Like it feels very uncomfortable if you even see like a good amount of people standing together, even though masks usually are on. There's um, some food trucks by um, our building where people get together like once a month to get food from food trucks and even seeing a bunch of people standing close to each other without masks on eating feels very uncomfortable. So things are very different. It, I definitely can see the impact. I think in the US too, there has been like what you said about, or what he said about the politics playing a role more so in the US than I think a lot of other countries. I think there are a lot of people here who don't want the vaccine and um, don't plan on getting it at all because they just, it's kind of been politicized in this country. So they kind of see it as like a one side versus the other side thing. Yeah, to, to add to that, there are people that I know who don't believe in the virus at all. So it, it, it was politicized, unfortunately. And so there, I know people who just flat out don't believe in the, in the pandemic. They think it's a hoax. And so they are not following any regulations like mask wearing or they don't want to get the vaccine or anything of the sort. Yeah, Kevin, you talked about how we changed presidents. And with that change came a lot of administration changes and a lot of policy changes. And I think we have found some improvements in uh, the policy and the leadership we see the new president always wearing his mask in public, and that kind of changes the way that the culture of the United States is. And I think it's a cultural problem uh, because people just don't uh, seem to care at the beginning uh, because the leadership didn't care. And now we're seeing that people are starting to care a little more. Uh, people are more used to the masks. I think, at least for the most part, uh, people have accepted mask wearing and distancing uh, from each other. And slowly we're getting better and we're seeing the death rate of COVID go down. We're seeing infections go down. And we've hit, I think today, 200 million uh, COVID vaccine doses in the United States, which is a huge uh, milestone for us. And it's just continuing to improve and hopefully the next couple of months will uh, keep getting better. I also wanted to point to um, something that highlights the difference between how Japan is handling the US. I've read a little bit about how Japan has handled the pandemic. And one thing that I remember reading about, I can't remember if it was May or March, it was probably May, Japan's government announced like, basically informing the people of Japan that there would be a new lifestyle, like, like encouraging people to adopt a lifestyle that promoted controlling the pandemic long-term 
compared to how America handled it, our government denied that it was an issue for a lot longer than that. So I think Japanese government coming out and telling the people to adjust versus our government telling people to ignore it was a big difference. Great points. Do you all want to talk a little bit about the Olympics and what is going on with that? Yuko or Kevin or Nobuya, so any of you can share. Yeah, uh, in less than 100 days, Japan will have Olympic, but I don't know it will be held because, yeah, because Tokyo and Osaka have a, uh, have a pandemic. It is very serious. So I think a lot of foreigners came to Olympic. A lot of foreigner players came, came to Japan to join the Olympic. The pandemic will be, became more serious. Um, yeah. And in Japan, a lot of ceremony, for example, uh, a lot of ceremony will can, will, uh, was cancelled. Yeah, so I think Olympic also will be cancelled, to be honest. Do you think the, so are the people in favor in Japan of the Olympics or they are not in favor of holding the Olympics? I I want to see Olympic, but my mother said uh, the Japan should not have Olympic. So, so you think it is the older population that does not want? Yes, because they worry about uh, about their heresy, heres about their heresy. Of course, it's more worrisome for them. The young people will be fine. Well, I think we have uh, two more minutes, but I wanted to take this time uh, perhaps to get a, a group photo um, with everyone. And then also um, we'll let uh, Dr. Menezes and Dr. Yamamoto give the final thank yous and farewells. Um, so in the count of three, we're gonna take a picture. Are we ready? All right, one, two, three. All right, perfect. So, uh, Dr. Yamamoto, would you like to um, to close out the meeting uh, with Kifu? Oh, thank you very much uh, for for taking your time and uh, good opportunity. I'm looking forward to the next chance to uh, collaborate with us. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, th really, this was such a wonderful conversation. I, I, you know, I, I sincerely thank all of you for participating. I know how early in the morning it is in Japan and um, truly appreciate all of your time. I think we all learned so much from you and I hope you learned a little bit about what is happening in the US as well. And we look forward to having more conversations like this. I don't know if any of the students want to Close out, Sharon, I think you were leading this group, but if you want to say a thank you on behalf of the students. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is very early in the morning for you. And uh, I think all of us are sorry if we spoke a little too fast, which is kind of natural for us. And uh, I know we tried a little bit to slow down. So hopefully you understood us, uh, but we enjoyed this meeting uh, and we want to do it again. Uh, this is all of us here, all five of us are first year medical students and we're just trying to learn. And uh, we enjoyed getting to know about Japan and the COVID uh, situation. And hopefully we'll take some of that in and improve uh, the situation in the United States just a little bit. Uh, but thank you everybody. 
And I hope that all of you will come and visit and rotate with us for your clinical electives. We look forward to hosting all of you. Yes. Have a lovely day. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you, everyone.